First time I ever seen myself on a baseball card. It's one of them feelings, uh, kind of surreal. I think it was pretty cool showing my dad. You know, my dad had one, so it's uh, pretty cool to be able to show him that uh, I finally got recognized enough to be able to in front of a card. Rush to left field. Good. My mind was blown away. You know, you dream all those moments when you're in high school, but when it actually happens, it's completely different, very surreal. Carlos Correa crushes one deep to left field. I feel good. <laughs> Soto's first hit of the year is a walk-off game winner. Welcome to the only baseball card show graded PSA 10. Today we find out how the pandemic changed the industry. Sneak a peek at celebrity chef Graham Elliott's personal collection and interview one of the baseball card goats, Don Mattingly. That and so much more next on MLB's Carded. This is MLB's Carded, where we take a look at baseball cards past, present, and future. From rip parties to rated rookies, it's just like opening a wax pack. You, you really never know what you're going to get. First up, we have Graham Elliott. He's an award-winning four-star chef and television host, known for shows like Master Chef, Top Chef, and Family Food Fight. He's also a baseball card aficionado, like me. Let's see what he's cooked up for his collection. This is 2015 Tops Graham Elliott first pitch insert card. And then this is Tops Allen and Ginter card that they made of mine where I signed them and, and they put them in packs. I have my own garbage pail kid that came out this year. It's me dipping my white glasses in white chocolate, the, the goopy Graham. For me, baseball cards are something that I always collected since as, as early as I can remember. Moving around all the time with my dad in the Navy, we were in the Philippines, Hawaii, all over. But I love the way that no matter where I was, baseball still made me feel American and centered me. Looking at cards, it's an extension of that, obviously, and it captures that moment in time. Napoleon Lajue, you got this Cracker Jack. Walter Johnson from 1914. This is one of my favorite cards of all time. It's 1911. Christy Mathewson. This is a 1981 Don Mattingly minor league rookie card. Pre-mustache. You say, okay, you know what? I have always wanted to own a Babe Ruth card. I don't care what it is. I just need to have one. These are all Babe Ruths. And then you start thinking, well, you know, I loved 1927 murders where I have to find something from that year. This here is a ticket to Lou Gehrig's uh, memorial. It becomes this hunt where it's like, I have to have this card. Oh my God, I found it. And then I get it and I'll hold it and be like, ooh, I feel good, I can sleep tonight. But now I really need to get that DiMaggio. These are DiMaggio's rookies, Ted Williams rookies, Stan Musial's rookies. You keep going down these, these different little rabbit holes. Willie Mays, you've got Jackie Robinson rookies. That's the 52 Tops Mantle, which is like the Holy Grail. As a kid, my favorite card was always the 1990 Leaf Frank Thomas card. It was actually card number 300. It was in the second series, so I remember everything about it. Also, 93 Upper Deck Brady Anderson. And the reason is I was living in Southern Maryland in the middle of nowhere, super lonely, horrible high school experience. And I remember reading somewhere that if you send cards in a self-addressed stamped envelope to players at spring training, they'll send them back. So I literally saved up money and I sent like 50 of them out and I got one single card back and it was that Brady Anderson one. And so it's been like 30 plus years I'm trying to find him to let him know how important that was. It's just something that you look at and you go back in time with. A four-star collection from a four-star guy. Now we go from a top chef to the top of tops. Card number one is a special place in baseball card history. This year, Top celebrates their 70th anniversary. So we took a look back at every series one card number one. Mm -hmm. 
After Topps debuted their so-called blue back and red back decks in 1951, Topps first annual set of baseball cards came out in 1952. Card number one was the Dodgers Andy Pafco. This card is extremely difficult to find in great condition because kids often just put the cards in numerical order and rubber banded them with Pafco taking the brunt of the abuse simply by being on top. You'll notice multiple appearances by Ted Williams as he was card number one three times in the 1950s. 1963 marked the first time multiple players appeared on a card number one. It featured the top five NL batting average leaders from the previous season. Tops kept up with the league leaders theme for card number one in 1964 and 65 and then returned to that format in 68 and 69. As we hit the 70s, Tops went with the previous season's World Series champs for card number one. So the decade began with team photos of the Mets, Orioles, and Pirates in that top spot. In the mid-70s, card number one was all Hank Aaron. First as he approached Babe Ruth's home run record, and then when he surpassed it. 1976 commemorated when the Hammer set the career RBI record as well. The late 70s and 80s were all leaders, record breakers, and season highlights. Topps used card number one to showcase these MLB milestones and achievements, but there was one exception. The only single regular player card selected for the top spot in the 1980s was Pete Rose in 1986. The 90s saw a return to single player regular cards for card number one. Nolan Ryan didn't appear as a card number one until 1990, but then repeated the feat in 91 and 92. Tony Gwynn also never had a card number one appearance until the late 90s, but he received the honor in both 1996 and 1998. In the first decade of the 2000s, one player dominated baseball, so it makes sense that he dominated Topps card number one selections as well. Alex Rodriguez claimed the honor in amazing five times between 2003 and 2009. The 2010s had your expected card number ones, Fielder, Braun, Harper, Trout, and Derek Jeter to celebrate his last season. But in 2016, Topps switched gears and began letting fans vote to select card number one. The only repeat selection in the fan vote so far has been Mike Trout in both 2016 and 2020. So who was the 2021 card number one? None other than Fernando Tatis Jr. And while someday that might enter the pantheon of baseball cards, coming up next, we talk to the man whose 1984 rookie card turned collecting from a hobby into an industry. Baseball cards are as popular as ever, with some valued at seven figures, like the Honus Wagner T206, the 2009 Bowman Mike Trout, or the 1952 Topps Mantle, which recently sold at auction for $5.2 million. But you can't talk cards without talking about the 1984 Topps Don Mattingly. At first base, number 23, Don Mattingly. So proud to have been able to play my entire career and be just a small part of this great organization. The 1980s was a golden age of collecting, and this Yankee was easily one of the most popular players. Known as the Hitman from 1984 to 1989, he put up legendary numbers, a whopping 902 OPS and 684 RBIs to go along with five gold gloves. His cards draw sometimes obsessive and avid collectors and are some of the most sought after in history. Let's welcome the current manager of the Miami Marlins, Don Mattingly, to the show. Don, good to see you. Uh, all these years later, are you still amazed at how the 1984 baseball card got so much traction and, and is still popular today? I, I am amazed. Obviously, that's a, that was a rookie card. You know, it's one of your first ones. And so you remember that when you get to the big leagues and you see your, see your face on a card. It's really cool. Yeah, and it's amazing that I know the market's going crazy right now with all different stuff. And it's really cool. I'm glad people are still interested in, in cards in general. It's been fun to watch. You, you do wonderful things with Mattingly Charities, and you've really timed this perfectly because of the pandemic and the quarantine, the surge of baseball card popularity is through the roof right now. Walk us through uh, your foundation and how you're using the momentum of baseball cards to even propel it further. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I appreciate you mentioning our nonprofit. We do great work 
uh, in Evansville for the underserved youth. Uh, we're basically in the poorest neighborhoods. We, we started with athletics and really have turned to probably more educational, you know, with STEM labs, uh, making sure kids have that opportunity uh, to at least have the chance to make a good decision. And that's really what we were trying to do. But as you talk about, the pandemic was perfect. The 2020 set came out of nowhere. We ended up buying them as a as our charity would buy X amount. Um, and then I would sign them and then we'd put them on the market. And, and we really were able to kind of supplement uh, the fundraiser by doing that. And it's, it's been really cool to be able to do that. Now, I love baseball cards. So this one particular card gets me fired up because you, look, you're wearing 46, not 23. You're listed as an outfielder slash first baseman. Uh, so walk me through uh, your mindset that year. I mean, you weren't Donnie baseball just yet. You didn't really have a position yet, did you? I did not. And I remember that season, 84, I'd, I'd made the team and played part-time in 83, ended up going to winter ball that year, that winter, and, and won a bat and title in Puerto Rico. And I remember coming back to spring, like I'm fighting for a job. And the first thing Yogi tells me is I'm gonna be the swing man. I'm gonna play some outfield. I'm gonna play right, I'm gonna play left, I'm gonna play some first. Uh, but I remember telling Yogi, I said, Yogi, when you get me in there, you're not gonna be able to get me out. And he just kind of went, okay, kid, you know, that type of thing. And. Uh, I finally got some playing time. Somebody got hurt, and I got two or three hits and got two or three the next day, and, and that was it after that. Yeah, I mean, you won a batting title. 84 becomes this incredible season for a 19th-round draft pick. And, oh, by the way, you're doing it in the Bronx wearing the Yankee pinstripes. So now this rookie card that everyone was getting, you know, late 83, they're sitting there going, I got a Don Mattingly rookie card. This kid was drafted in the 19th round. No big deal. Should I even keep it? Now you're the star of the New York Yankees, and this baseball card becomes red hot. What was that time like for you in 84? It was great because you're having success, right? And you're kind of getting, starting to realize a dream that you've had since you were a kid and you say I was a star, but not really. We had Ricky and Winnie and Willie Randolph and Ron Guidry and guys like that. So I was just one of the guys right at that point, trying to find my way and lucky to be a part of a great veteran group came up with Pinella and Greg Nettles and guys that, you know, kind of showed you the way you go about your business. You know, you kind of build into what you become. How about the relationship that has become from all of these people that are so loyal to Don Mattingly baseball cards and the baseball card company of Tops? the relationship you have with them? It's been great, really, to hear people and, you know, they tell you about their collections. Um, they're kind of still kind of looking for you to sign cards. Uh, Tops has been been a been great for me because you know tops has been the main company there's obviously been other companies over the years but you know tops has kind of stood the test of time that's the first company that comes to you when you're a rookie and they you know i don't even know they give you five bucks or something i don't know what they give you but you're you're happy to get it and it, it's just been one of those things that right to be able to grow with that and and again you kind of started with the charity and that's where it goes back to now we're able to be able to put funds uh, into the charity, be able to help kids. And it's, it's, it's good to be able to use your platform in that way. Do you know that you're so popular when it comes to baseball cards that obviously there are only so many Don Mattingly rookie cards. There are now, there's a new obsession. I know guys that love these cameo cards. Have you heard of this? So they're baseball cards where it's not your card, but you're actually seen in the backdrop of someone else's baseball card. Have you heard yeah. of this phenomenon? I have not. I have not. I'm looking forward to it. You're going you're gonna to tell me about it? Oh, oh, done. The variety is unbelievable. You're seen in the backdrop of so many baseball cards, and guys oh, can't get, cool. we can't get enough of these. They're called cameo cards. All right, cool. <laughs> Don Mattingly, thank you so much for talking about one of my favorite subjects, baseball cards, which, of course, you are a historic superstar of. Thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. All right, Greg. Good talking to you. All of them. I got all my cards because for me, like when I was a kid, that was a dream come. It's a dream come true. See yourself in the baseball card. There's nothing like seeing yourself on a baseball card. For players, it's validation that all the hard work you've put in has paid off. You finally made it to the show. In 1988, my buddy Al Leiter 
wasn't the big TV star he is now. He was an MLB future star, and he has the baseball card to prove it. Or does he? Back in the day, you had photo day, and I, uh, you, you put, put your number in front of you. Uh, I was 56, my first big league camp. So you take the 56, you pose, and there's your baseball card. So the first time when this came out, I'm, I'm, I, I get called up in 1987, finish uh, September call up, and I was doing a little league banquet in New Jersey. Kid came up, said, Mr. Leiter, the tops just came out with the 88 set. I have your card, would you sign it? Yeah, of course, kid. He runs over to his table, he comes back, and he plops this in front of me. And immediately I look and I'm like, what? This isn't me. The understanding was that on his glove, Steve George, SG56, ended up being the reason why Top said, yeah, this must be Al Leiter. They don't know who you are, and obviously, you know, I was playing on a team with star players, Ron Guidry and Don Mattingly and Dave Winfield and Willie Randolph and others, so um, that was the determination that this was Al Leiter, and they were wrong. And then fast forward, the, the way in which that they, they, uh, they produce these things are on, on, a, on a big metal plate and my understanding is 144 of them and there's just cards right all the way across to make this big plate and I was the the error card was card number 18 and my representative uh, said well instead of putting the mistake card of Al Leiter at the back of the set you're going to replace number 18 I didn't think it was a big deal but apparently that one move made it more valuable for the collectors because they had to replace and redo the whole plate. So my corrected card uh, is also number 18 for uh, tops, and they, it, it was a little bit of a jumping through the hoops um, that they uh, they corrected the uh, my first big league card tops. I'm not sure how you could confuse Al Leiter with anyone else, but it ended up with a classic card. These are exactly the kind of items collectors went crazy for in the 80s card boom. But for following decades, the industry settled, and collecting seemed to be limited to a much smaller, hardcore group. Then came 2020 and the global pandemic that really changed everything, including the baseball card industry. The emotions and feelings connected to nostalgia are very, very powerful. So it's not that just that you look through the baseball cards and you see, oh, I remember Jeff Bagwell or I remember Ozzie Smith. You remember being a little kid. You remember watching them on TV. You remember opening packs of baseball cards with your friends. It's a powerful feeling of happiness, right? In 2020, there was a, there was a lot of a lot of sadness, a lot of. Uh, introspection and people dove headfirst back into this thing that made them happy. We are probably one of the few businesses that thrived in 2020. People were looking for something to do and that hobby that they may have put aside for 10, 15, 20 years um, filled a need. We did not see this coming. Um, we were closed again for 11 weeks and we had two weeks of curbside pickup but had no idea it would be like this, and I'm surprised it's been this busy this long. You know, there's only so much Netflix you can watch, there's only so many movies you can stream. So I think people started kind of cleaning out their attics, cleaning out their basements, and as they're doing that, you find these baseball cards and you start flipping through them and they really kind of lifted their spirits, even for a little bit, and then you chase that feeling. And I think a lot of people really found a sense of community there. The last big boom ended because overproduction of the product. It was a hot collectible when we opened in 89, not just with baseball fans, but across the board. In the 80s and 90s, they recognized the demand and they just made millions of baseball cards. They just flooded the markets with the same cards. So now companies are still producing a lot of cards, but they're trying to keep the demand for certain things. That's why they have parallels, they have numbered cards. At least in theory, keeping the value up while producing a lot of cards so that everyone's not getting the same ones over and over. This audience that has grown tremendously may not be there 
forever. So if you, if you keep the product lines limited, and that'll keep the value high and that'll keep people involved. It's not just the number of people who are in, it's not just the money that they're spending. It is how much people have completely jumped back into this in a way that they hadn't since they were 10 to 12 years old. For people who collect, it's always been something that would kind of bring back a memory. So I think there's gonna be continued interest, maybe not as it is right now, but yeah, no, I, we're, very, we're very happy about the fact that so many new people have, have or people have re-entered the hobby and new people have entered it. Everybody loves a good comeback story, and this one looks like it's here to stay. That just about does it for this episode of MLB's Carded, but what would a show about baseball cards be without a good old-fashioned pack rip? So here he is one more time, the hitman, Mr. Don Mattingly. Uh, come on, cards, open up. Oh, here we go, right here. Ted Simmons, inducted to the Hall of Fame going last year, but be going in this year. Congratulations, Ted, Mike Schmidt, how great was he? Uh, obviously, probably the greatest, one of the, if not the greatest, the greatest third baseman of all time. John the Count Montefusco, yes. Yeah, Colts Neck, New Jersey. Yeah, the Count in San Francisco, played with him in New York. Uh, then I see Lonnie Smith and John Stuper here on this card. The Hawk, Andre Dawson, uh, wow. The Hawk, met him probably more than anything, got to really get to know him uh, in Miami, going to manage there, and, and Hawk was with the organization. Probably one of the best guys you'll ever meet in the game. True gentleman. Uh, yeah, and Hawk, obviously, Hall of Famer. Matt Young, dirty. Matt Young was dirty. This lefty right here. I'm not sure he knew where it was going all the time, but that slider was unhittable, uh, at least for me. Mario Soto, I remember him with the Reds. Ray Fontenot. <clears throat> Played with Ray in Greensboro, North Carolina, and then in New York. Uh, another, it was part of the Louisiana Thunder and Lightning. I think they called Ray Thunder and, and, and Gator was Louisiana Lightning, Ron Guidry. This is what it's all about, you know, being able to reminisce, look at cards, enjoyment for people, connections with families. Uh, thanks, Tops, for letting me be a part of your family. <laughs>